Dear brothers and sisters, I'm delighted to be here this uh, morning for this devotional and uh, thank uh, the invitation to come and speak at this distinguished uh, institution. I am grateful for uh, the words of Sister Teixeira because I do share the same testimony as she does. Uh, as we put our own bread in the toaster, uh, we'll be able to see the miracle of a toast for breakfast. I'm certain of that. But we do need to put that bread. In that spirit today, I would like to speak uh, to you uh, from my prepared remarks on matters of uh, spiritual significance. I wanted to talk about spiritual treasures and how they really are of eternal value. Some research suggests that different types of thinking can lead to different outcomes depending on the context and the goal at hand. Consider, for example, creative thinking, which generates generate fresh ideas, or analytical thinking, which evaluates and refines existing ideas. Critical thinking can help uh, identify and avoid logical fallacies, while concrete thinking can help us focus on practical and realistic solutions. Abstract thinking, on the other hand, can help us understand complex and abstract concepts, while divergent thinking can help explore multiple possibilities and perspectives. Convergent thinking selects the best option, whereas synthesis thinking integrates information. These types of thinking are not mutually exclusive, and they can be combined and applied in different kinds of situations. And then there is celestial thinking, or thinking celestial. Thinking celestial is a phrase that President uh, Russell M. Nelson used in his October 2023 General Conference Address to invite us to adopt the practice of being spiritually minded. President Nelson promised during that talk that if we think celestial, we will be blessed with peace, joy, and happiness in this life and in the life to come. Reading President Nelson's counsel over and over again caused me to ponder how much celestial thinking is it really taking place in our daily lives and how, how is it this kind of thinking refining our understanding and following of Heavenly Father's plan for us. Which is, as President Nelson referred to it, as fabulous and eternal. I'm so grateful to know that Jesus Christ is our Savior and Redeemer. He is the Son of God and He was sent here to save us all. As Sister Teixeira said, His mission will not be concluded until uh, every one of us has access to that redeeming power. Because of Him, we can find joy in knowing that we can live with God and our loved ones for eternity. Look at the scripture that says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. As His followers, we strive to be like Him and to reflect His love in our lives. Putting Jesus Christ first is a lifelong pursuit as our eternal life totally depends on our faith in Him and His atonement and our obedience to His laws. The many choices we make each day, including how we spend our time, are critical to our connection with what truly matters most in life. I recently read a true account that took place in the Netherlands during the 1970s energy crisis and oil embargo 
that might illustrate this important principle that I tr I'm trying to get across to you and the significance of small decisions and choices that we do in our lives which can help us remain focused on things of eternal value. Dutch researchers began to pay close attention to the country's energy usage. In one suburb near Amsterdam, they found that some homeowners use 30% less energy than their neighbors, despite the homes being a similar size and getting electricity at the same price. In turn, uh, they found out that the houses in this neighborhood were nearly identical, except for one small feature, the location of the electrical meter. Some have that electrical meter in the basement. Others have the electrical meter upstairs in the main hallway. As you might guess, those that have the meters in the main hallway used less energy. People changed their behavior when their energy use was obvious and easy to track. This account caused me to think that if we too, at times, have our spiritual meters out of sight, perhaps installed in the basement, distant from our own sights and from our own thoughts and our own priorities, that will influence how we spend our time and our energy during each and every day of our lives. During the Sermon of the Mountain, the Lord helped illustrate the importance of this principle. And it is clear in His teachings that He wants us to consider how precious it is, these teachings, and how precious it is for us to seek treasures by seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. He said in Matthew chapter 6, For where is your treasure, there will your heart be also. This statement, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, is part of a larger passage in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus is teaching His disciples about the importance of prioritizing spiritual values over material ones. In this particular context, Jesus cautioned against the pursuit of early, earthly treasures such as wealth, acclaim in the world, and we do so at the expense of our spiritual well-being and our relationship with God. By saying, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also, Jesus highlighted that our priorities and commitments shape our innermost being. If we prioritize material wealth, worldly recognition, and success, our hearts and desires will focus on acquiring exactly those things. Conversely, if we prioritize spiritual values such as love, compassion, and righteousness, our hearts will be inclined towards pursuing and cultivating those qualities. The Savior's teachings encourage self-reflection and introspection. He challenges us as individuals to examine where we invest our time, energy, and resources as these choices reveal the true priorities and values that we have. Jesus' teachings suggest to me personally that true fulfillment and spiritual abundance come from aligning our hearts with the things that have last significance and eternal value rather than transient or fleeting possessions or worldly popular trends. The statement in the book of Matthew emphasizes the profound connection between our priorities 
in our heart's condition, urging us to seek spiritual treasures that endure well beyond the material world. Metaphorically speaking, aren't we all collecting treasures in this life? Because we all make choices every day, we are building the treasures that result from those choices that we make every day. Jesus admonishes us that no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon, and that we should seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness. And again, the Lord beautifully reminds us that we should first seek the kingdom of God as an integral part of who we are, seeking to hear Him and to live by His precepts and teachings. For a moment, let us explore further Matthew 6 and the Lord's teachings of laying not up for ourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rot doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay for, our, for yourselves, for ourselves, treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. What a beautiful language Jesus used to emphasize the importance of prioritizing spiritual wealth over material possessions. Material possessions are subject to decay, theft, and loss, but spiritual treasures are eternal and cannot be taken away. The contrast between treasures on earth and in heaven underscores the temporary nature of worldly goods compared with the eternal rewards of heavenly treasures. Earthly treasures like wealth, fame, Popularity and possessions are fleeting and ultimately unsatisfying in the grand scheme of eternity. Jesus encourages us to invest our time, resources, and efforts in pursuits that align with God's kingdom and that bring about spiritual growth and transformation. Certainly, this will include acts of charity, love, compassion, and service to family and to others around us. Jesus encourages each one of us to embrace an attitude of detachment from earthly treasures and focus instead on spiritual growth and righteousness. Some years ago, in a message of general conference, while speaking there, I spoke of the popularity of the digital area that we now live in. I reviewed some simple habits to establish healthy online activity and affirmed at that conference that life is not confined to a four-inch screen. You might say a six-inch screen today. Suggesting that while these technologies represent an extraordinary advancement, if they are left unchecked, they give precedent to relationships with people that we don't know or have never met, and uh, rather to give that attention to people that we live with, including our own family. Since then, the expansion and reach of these technologies have accelerated at an enormous speed. Today, our lives are part of these networked environments as never before. They are boasted by social media platforms and AI-driven apps that optimize user engagement and satisfaction by delivering personalized content and instant rewards. Now, in many countries of the world, people spend a significant portion of their time and their day connected to their devices. 
This is especially true with the proliferation of powerful mobile devices, which allow people to stay connected at all time, whatever they are. The data suggests that the general population uh, and specific demographic groups, like the rising generation, spend many hours of the day in their mobile devices. There is no denying from any of us here that we live in a highly connected era. As of 2023, 82% of Americans, totally 270 million people, own a smartphone. The average American spends about six hours a day on their mobile device, and they check their phone on average 96 times a day, or at least once every 10 minutes. A culture of instant gratification online may contribute to unrealistic expectations and impatience in other areas of life. As we become accustomed to immediate feedback and rewards in our online interactions, this may diminish our ability to delay gratification and tolerate boredom or frustration. And even more importantly, it might distance us from the necessary effort to listen to the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. We can counter this culture and these trends as we demonstrate our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ through our commitment to follow Him and His teachings. In today's world, you and I carry the Holy Scripture and the Word of Living Prophets in our pockets pretty much every day. As these resources are available to us, we can turn our thinking to celestial things, and we can build our spirituality by turning to these spiritual treasures and seek these eternal riches, making the Savior the source of our hope. The Prophet Mormon asked, What is it that he shall hope for? He then answered, He shall have hope through the atonement of Christ and the power of his resurrection to be raised unto life eternal, and this because of your faith in him, according to the promise. Embracing Christ-like attributes of virtue, integrity, and patience can fortify us and help us prioritize eternal riches over earthly treasures. Virtue originates in our thoughts and desires. The Lord said, Let virtue garnish thy thoughts instantly. When you have integrity, you understand that there is a right and wrong, and that there is an absolute truth, God's truth. You use your agency to choose according God's truth, and you promptly repent when you do not. What you choose to think, and what you do when you believe no one else is watching, are a strong measure of your integrity. Patience, on the other hand, is tied closely to faith in our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. Patience is not indifference. It means caring very much, but nevertheless being willing to submit to the Lord. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, When we are unduly impatient, we are suggesting that we know what is best, better than does God. Or at least we are asserting that our timetable is better than His. Our mortal experiences will be replete with unexpected challenges. Still, when we are firmly anchored in Jesus Christ, we patiently work through our trials and tribulations and draw upon the strength and the reservoir as spiritual treasures that He provides us. I leave with you my conviction and testimony that as we make concerted efforts to prioritize things of eternal value, 
And as we embed in our daily living Christ-like attributes and consciously use our time seeking first the kingdom of God, we will be blessed with purpose and our choices, either they be online or otherwise, will be guided by the desire to live with meaning and joy. I leave with you my testimony that I know that Christ lives, that He is our Redeemer and Savior. Soon we will be commemorating Easter and His glorious resurrection. As we prepare for that event, may I extend you an invitation. An invitation to make a decision to follow the Lord first in everything else that we do. And all other blessings will be ours because of that choice. May the Lord bless you in your pursuit for an education to do good things in life and to live a life with purpose, meaning, and joy. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.